This is just a quick video to run through the three different types of hypothesis testing in the A-level maths statistics section. Um, I'm not going to do any actual hypothesis tests in this video. Those are, well, the details of those are quite complicated and, and need to be taught separately. So this is just really a review of the different types that there that might come up and the differences and similarities between them. Um, in all of them, you're going to have to state hypotheses in this form of uh, H0, the null hypothesis, and H1, the alternative. That happens in all three types of hypothesis test. Um, we've got the hypothesis testing with the binomial distribution, which is the year one topic. And then in year two, you see hypothesis testing using the normal distribution. And also you do hypothesis testing for correlation. So... Um, starting with binomial, the year one, what to look out for that tells you that this is a binomial um, that you're meant to be using, using binomial distribution. So remember the, the four things, the four criteria in order to use a binomial distribution. You need a fixed number of trials. There need to be two outcomes, which we deal with as success or failure. It's like, yes, the plant flowers or no, the plant doesn't flower or yes, the plant produces yellow flowers and no, it doesn't. Uh, no, it produces some different color. So it's either yes or no. Um, those trials are independent of each other, which means that there is a fixed probability of success. Uh, often in the question, the distribution will already have been defined for you. So it will already say that X is the number of, uh, say, plants that are bulbs that produce yellow flowers or, or whatever it is. Um, it is this phrase, X is the number of something. X is not the probability. A lot of people write that the variable is the probability of something. It's not. It's always the, the number of things. Um, everything that's written down on the screen so far is what is needs to be written every single time you write this. And we'll, we'll analyze this with the hypotheses here. So if you're using a binomial distribution, you are testing a probability. So your distribution is set up with this probability that you then go into more detail on when you state your hypotheses. So your null hypotheses will, hypothesis will be that a probability is a particular value. Um, let's just say I've put in a square here because whatever value goes here also goes here every time. It's got to have the same value in both hypotheses. So let's say the probability was 0.7. That would be your probability equals 0.7. The, null, the alternative hypothesis would be that the probability doesn't equal 0.7 in some way. So that same 0.7 goes in, has to, whatever number is here has to go here. And the only options that you have to think about here are either probability is greater than or less than or not equal to. Uh, not equal to obviously leads to a two-tailed test, which means that you split the significance level. So uh, a level of 10% would be split into 5% in each tail if you're using not equal to, whereas greater than or less than is a one-tailed test, and you'd have that full 10% in one tail. Um, once you've set that up, you're going to introduce your test statistic for the first time. So the test statistic is some value that you're given in the question. Um, for example, you know, you've got your 30 flower bulbs and two of them have produced yellow flowers. So that's your test statistic is the two out of 30. And you use that probability with your null hypothesis, the probability of 0 0.7. Uh, and that means you're using your binomial CD mode normally or always, in fact, binomial, binomial CD mode on your calculator to work that out the probability that X is less than or greater than the test statistic that you've got. Then you will compare that with your significance level. So if it was the 10%, it would be a 0.1. Or if it was 10% two-tailed, you'd be splitting that significance level, so you'd be going down to 0.05. Um, and you're looking for something that is less likely. So... If you get a value that's greater than, let's just use that 0.11. If you get something like 0.23, that's fine. That's pretty normal compared to a probability of 10%. But if you get less than 10% and you're comparing to 0.1, then that is enough to convince you that there's something wrong with this hypothesis, the probability of 0.7. And therefore, you would reject that and accept the alternative or say that there is evidence to suggest the alternative. 
Okay, again, this is all a little bit abstract because I'm not actually running the numbers. Um, but again, this is not about doing the test. It's about identifying the differences between them. It's important to have a structure like this that you're using every time because that allows you to identify when you're in an exam question and the exam questions are often phrased quite in quite a complicated way. Um, if you've got a clear structure that you're always sticking to this layout then you will be able to identify which values you have and where they're meant to go and how to use them. Um, of course, there are different ways of setting these up. Sometimes exam questions can ask for critical regions or can put questions in an even more complicated way. But again, if you've got this basic setup that you know how to use every time, then that helps you to define the question and, and work out exactly what the problem is, what's missing. Um, so onto the normal. This is the end of the year two um, uh, statistics um, syllabus. So this is the final section of the year two statistics syllabus is hypothesis testing with a sample mean. And this is when you're comparing the mean of a sample. So you're told that, uh, I don't know, there's that one with the drinks cartons where um, the drink cartons claim to have a mean of 50 millimeters, 50 milliliters of juice in. Uh, but actually you take a sample of 15 of them and the mean of that sample is, say, only 45 milliliters of juice. Is that enough to persuade you that there's something wrong uh, with the claim of 50 milliliters. So you're comparing with an assumed mean, which is the 50 milliliters, um, and you're using a sample to do that. Uh, and in this situation, again, everything that's written on the screen is there every single time you do one of these tests. So you have your variable distributed normally with um, a mean of undefined at the moment, mu, and you will have some value in there. So sigma squared, uh, let's just say that that is, um, I don't know, 1.2. That value will be used all the way through, and it will be used later on down here as well. Whatever value that you're given in the question for the standard deviation. And again, x is the number of something, not the probability of something or the mean of anything. It's just the number of things that happen. Often that will be defined in the question for you. So in these hypotheses, you've always got the null hypothesis that mean the mean equals some particular value. And the alternative hypothesis will always be that the mean doesn't equal that same value in some way. And again, what I mean by that is the mean is either greater than that value, less than that value, or not equal to that value. But it's always the same value here as it's here. You would only use the, the sample mean later on in the question which means that once you've set up your hypotheses like this, you will then show that under the null hypothesis where the mean is this particular value, your sample mean, and this is the bit that's new for, for the year two bit for the normal distribution, your sample mean, which is x bar, is distributed normally with the same mean that you have in your hypothesis, and the standard deviation well, the variance, in fact, is uh, divided by the number of um, elements in your sample. So if n is your sample size, what you'll be typing into your calculator when you work out the distribution is that sigma equals 1.2, in this case, over root size of your sample. So if you had 10 things in your sample, that would be where the 10 goes, root 10. So remember to type that square root in your calculator when you use that. And again, then you're finally, only at this point, would you bring in the test statistic. Um, in my example, the 45 milliliters probability that x bar is less than or equal to 45 under that distribution. You work out that value and again compare with your significance level in exactly the same way as you would with a binomial. So if it's a more extreme probability, as in a lower probability than your significance level, then you would reject the null hypothesis. And finally, hypothesis testing for correlation this has exactly the same starting point every single time. Remember, you're using rho rather than r, and your null hypothesis is always that there is no correlation between two variables. So this is a, a very different type of test. In this one, you're using the tables, um, the statistical tables provided in the exam, uh, with the number of, again, n equals 
the number of data points that you have and you'll be also using the um, significance level. And again, so you've got your null hypothesis is always, always, always this, that there is no correlation. Your alternative hypothesis is that there is some kind of correlation. And again, that's either going to be a positive correlation, rho is greater than zero, a negative correlation if rho is less than zero, or any kind of correlation where you're looking for rho not equaling zero. And again, in that case, you would split the significance level Um, then you're going to find the critical value from a table and then you're going to compare that with the R value that you're given from your sample. So that's either something that they've given you in the question or something that they've asked you to calculate in the question for your sample. Remember the row represents the underlying population. So for example if your sample is, I don't know, 10 days of, of um, uh, rainfall in a particular location, your sample is, is 10 and you can the R value tells you whether there's any correlation in your sample. This test tells you whether there's any correlation. Um, I said rainfall, let's say rainfall and hours of sunshine. So this tests whether there's any underlying correlation in the, in the underlying populations of rainfall and hours of sunshine. Um, again, if you have, for example, a, a critical value of, say, 0.315, and that's the value you get from your table. And your R value that you got earlier in the question is, let's say, minus 0 0.582. Remember, you're only going to get positive values from the table. So we've obviously got a negative one here, and we need to compare with the, this but in negative form. So we would say that minus 0 0.582, in fact, I would actually say that the critical value is minus 0.315 here. Minus 0.582 is more correlated, it's further from zero than minus 0.315, which is the critical value. So if it's further from zero, if it's more correlated than the critical value, you are going to reject the null hypothesis. That suggests if it's more correlated than the critical value, it suggests that there is some correlation and your null hypothesis was that there is no correlation, and that's always the case. So in this case, having made that comparison, I would say therefore reject H0, and there is evidence to suggest correlation. Uh, it may be positive correlation if that's what you were asked for, or negative. Oh, this would be negative, but it might just be, if it was a not equal to test, it might just be correlation um, between whatever variables. You do need to mention the variables in your answer. All of these need to have full written answers explaining exactly what you found. So explaining whether you're accepting or rejecting H0 and then putting into context what that tells you after this hypothesis test. Okay, so that is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, abstract discussion of these hypothesis tests but uh, like i said at the beginning what's really important is that you have a structure that you are expecting to use in every question so that you can identify what type of um, hypothesis test you're doing and then what's missing from your hypothesis test so that you can work out and problem solve that way um, for actually doing the tests, you just need to do lots of practice of each one and check that you're making the right assumptions. There are plenty of videos on YouTube about the individual tests, so hopefully you can find those if you need any help with them. Um, otherwise, you can write in the comments and I might be able to find something else that's useful. Okay, that's it for now.